You didn't think Biden should debate. Do you still feel that way? Freedom prospers when religion is vibrant and the rule of law under God is acknowledged. An informed patriot is what we want. Welcome to American Family Radio's Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Muscular Christianity. Where we relentlessly explore the intersection of truth and politics. The trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant. It's just that they know so much that isn't so. Now, here's your host, Brian Fisher. Howdy, and welcome to a brand new week of broadcasting here on American Family Radio and Focal Point. Brian Fisher is my name. Program is Focal Point. I am your host, Brian Fisher, congenial, convivial, amiable, and effervescent. As As always. always. Jeff and Rob in the house at full strength today, the three amigos riding full speed ahead. We missed Jeff on Friday. We'll hear from him in just a moment as to why we gave him a excused absence on Friday, and you'll see that it was an absence, excused absence worth extending. So we'll hear from him going into the second uh, segment uh, today. All right, very quickly, a couple of quick items. Don't forget podcasts available at AFR.net. You can communicate with us via email at focalpoint at AFA.net. We have opinion pieces up at AFA.net at the, the stand is what it's called. But I've got a new column up there today. So you can go to AFA.net. It'll be right there. The column that I've written about the interpreting the Constitution and Amy Coney Barrett. You can go there for that. Don't forget, you can live stream the program on our Focal Point Facebook page, video and audio, and on our Focal Point YouTube channel. So go there. I encourage you to do that. Also, you can go to AFAstore.net, buy a copy of my Book for Fathers, the Boy to Man book for fathers of 12-year-old sons. You can get it at afastore.net. Also, share coming up in October. We'd love to hear your listener testimonies about how God has used the programming at AFR Talk to help you. So if you've been helped, for instance, by a program like Focal Point or any of the other talk radio programs, you can give us a call and leave your testimonial at 877-876-8899. Three. All right, well, let's uh, turn our attention to the Word of God as we customarily do at the beginning of the program. Today we are in Numbers 22. This is the famous story of Balaam, the prophet that took money to put a curse on the people of Israel. This is where the story starts. It occupies four chapters in Numbers. A lot of space devoted to this story, so it's an indication that Moses thought that this was a really, really important story to be sure we understand. Here's how it begins. They were camped, the nation of Israel, in the plains of Moab. This is out of Numbers 22. Moab was in great dread of the people because they were so many. So they were shaking in their boots because the people of Israel were flooding the plains of Moab. Moab was overcome with fear because of the people of Israel. And they said, this horde will now lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So they were toast. They say, we can't handle an opponent this size. So Balak, the king of Moab, sent messengers to Balaam, verse 6, saying, come now and curse this people for me. So they knew they didn't have military might, so they appealed to the forces of darkness. They appeal to satanic strength to defeat their enemy. Come now and curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. Now, one of the important things to realize here is that curses that are uttered, curses that are sent out by those who are experienced in the dark arts can be very powerful and effective. For instance, covens, and there are covens meeting Every night, all over the United States of America, covens typically meet at midnight and their rituals are done between midnight and, say, 2 or 3 in the morning. And then at 2 or 3 in the morning, when they disband, they direct curses toward people or organizations that represent a threat to the kingdom of darkness. So sometimes you may wake up at 2 or 3 in the morning in in total terror. And that may be somebody has... Some coven or some other worker of darkness has sent a curse 
against you to trouble you. I remember one time, I've told this story before, one time I was sound asleep, 3 o'clock in the morning, I mean on the dot, I felt somebody grab my ankle and start pulling me off the bed. Now I knew right away what it was, and I knew that I needed to declare the name of Jesus. Remember, Satan cannot read our thoughts, only God can do that. So we must do what Jesus did when we're under the assault of the evil one, and that is to speak out loud a word of rebuke. So I tried to speak the name of Jesus, and it was like something was lodged in my throat. I struggled against that. Finally, I was able to croak out the name of Jesus, and whatever it was immediately released its grip and vanished. So anyway, Balak, when he was approached, by the uh, by this king, he sought permission from Yahweh. Notice he was talking to Yahweh. Uh, so somehow, we don't know how things work always in the world of the spirit, but Balak had access to Yahweh in the spirit as a, a worker of the dark arts. He sought permission from Yahweh to go with him, and God spoke with him, speaking here to a totally pagan prophet. So you just, I mean, just when you think you got God figured out, something like this comes up. He says, God spoke with him, and he said, I will bring word back to you as Yahweh speaks to me. That's what Balak, uh, what Balaam says to these representatives from Balak. I got to meet with Yahweh. I got to hear what he has to say. As soon as he tells me what he wants me to do, I'll come back and tell you what he told me. So God says to Balaam then in verse 12, you shall not go with them. Balaam says, I'd like to have permission to go and do this thing for the people of Moab. He says, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse these people, for they are blessed. That's what God says, Yahweh says to Balaam. He says, I know your curses are powerful, Balaam. I've seen them work, but you better not curse my people. I have blessed them. I am watching over them, and I am protecting them, and you do not want to get in my way. So... The people from Moab keep offering him more money to come and come and pronounce the curses. Finally, God says to Balaam in verse 20, rise and go with them. All right, Balaam, you can go, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam saddled up his donkey and went with the prince, princes of Moab. But then we find in the next verse, 22, God's anger was kindled because he went. So God just gave Balaam permission to go, and then he saddles his donkey and takes off, and God's anger was kindled against him. Well, why? Well, remember, God knows everything, and he remember, he had told Balaam, only do what I tell you. He could see into Balaam's heart, and he knew that Balaam was not going to do what God had told him to do. King of Moab kept dangling money in front of him, kept raising the offer, finally made him an offer he could not refuse. And the Lord could see that Balaam had decided he was going to go and he was going to accept the money and he was going to stick the money in his own pocket. So the angel of the Lord confronted them as they were leaving. The donkey saw, Balaam's donkey, saw that the angel of the Lord was standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. So the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. Uh, tried to go around the angel. And so Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the road. So he's saying, look, you stupid donkey, you're making me look bad in front of these hot rocks from Moab. You're about ready to spoil a really big payday for me. You know, I think it's an indication that maybe animals have a keener sensitivity to what's going on in the unseen world even uh, than we do. So anyway, Balaam steered the donkey right back on the road and kept going. He wasn't going to be deterred. So he gets the donkey back on the road, beating him with a rod all the way along. So the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. So the donkey saw the angel of the Lord with a raised sword and tried to go around the angel. And he pinned Balaam's foot between his body, or her body, it's a female donkey, and the stone wall crushed his ankle, and that really torqued Balaam off, so he struck the donkey again. He kept beating her until she got back on the path. Verse 26, Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left, 
So when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she just lay down. She says, nothing's, wor nothing's working here. I try to go off the path. Balaam beats me till I get back on the path. I try to swerve around the angel. I pin his foot against the stone wall, and he beats me again. There's nothing I can do. I'm just going to lay down in the middle of the road. And it's a reminder because he saw the angel with a raised sword. So it's a reminder to us that God's warrior angels are not docile creatures. They're not like those little angel figurines who used to get at Hallmark, all cherubic and cute and completely tame. Now, the donkey knew that whatever this angel was, it was not a tame angel. So the Lord, Yahweh, opened the mouth of the donkey. And the donkey says to Balaam, why are you beating me? You've been cracking my head three times. What have I done to you except try to protect you from that warrior guy with the machete? Wants to cut your head off and my head too. So I saved your life and this is how you thank me? So all of a sudden, Balaam is hip, hip deep in a shouting match with a mule. And he doesn't even realize it. <laughs> now this is a reminder that God can in fact speak through anyone, even a dumb animal. And maybe it's an alert that there might have been a time when men could communicate more freely with the animal kingdom than we do now. Remember, Eve had a chat with a talking snake, and it seemed perfectly normal to her, like something she did all the time to talk to members of the animal kingdom. So anyway, the donkey says in verse 30, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life to this day? Is it my habit to treat you in this way? And Balaam says, No, you've been a good donkey, donkey. So then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down. The angel says, I have come out to oppose you because your way is perverse. Literally, it is reckless before me. So God says, normally, Balaam, I'd pick you over the donkey, but she's obeying me, and you are not. Happens one more time. I am definitely picking her over you. Now, what we don't often realize is that one of the reasons we run into stubborn, immovable blockages, boulders in the road we're on that we cannot get around, is that God is trying to protect us from ourselves. And I've often said that the best answer to prayer I've ever gotten is no. That's God saving me from myself. So Balaam repents in verse 34. He says, I have sinned. I did not know that you stood in the road against me. If it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. So God again forgives him. And because of his patience, he says to Balaam again, go with the men. But again, he says, speak only the word I tell you. So what this, <coughs> what this tells us is that God had a plan to reach Moab to communicate his truth to them through Balaam. But Balaam refused to cooperate. You know, so it makes us wonder what kind of opportunities to advance the kingdom of God we might have missed because we got drawn off our game by our love of money or our own stubbornness. Well, let's go to prayer. Almighty God, I pray that the presence of your people in this community and in this nation will cause great dread among the principalities and powers that oppose you. May they be overcome with fear because of the size and strength of your people. I pray that your people will cover the face of our land and be too mighty in Christ for the world forces of this present darkness. I pray that you will protect us from any and all curses that are sent against us by the enemies of the gospel. May those who rely on the powers of darkness to resist the advance of your people find themselves frustrated at every turn by your intervention. I pray you will frustrate and block every curse that's spoken against our people and release your blessing over our land and the place of every curse. In Jesus' name, amen.
This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Brian Fisher is my name. I mentioned that uh, we gave Jeff Reed an excused absence to go to D.C. over the weekend. So we want to get a report, make sure that uh, we're getting our money's worth out of the excused Mm -hmm. absence we gave him. Those things are not cheap. So we only extend those in really, really important situations. So, Jeff, talk to us about what you and Ann did in D.C. Yeah, there was, was two events that happened simultaneously on the Washington Mall. Uh, They weren't in competition. They weren't arranged that way. It just was coincidence that they both happened on the same day. One was called the Return, and that was down near on the other side of the Washington Monument. Uh, Franklin Graham had the Prayer March 2020, which started at the uh, Lincoln Memorial and marched through in different spots all the way down the mall to the Capitol and stopping and praying at each one of these stations. Mm. Now, what was really cool about this is as the one crowd marched down they joined the other crowd and it turned into an army wow. of, of people marching to the capitol wow. uh, but i, w- I want to tell you that we 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 left early to get to the lincoln memorial to find a good spot you know being part of the media I wanted a good spot where we could get a good view of everything and w- we got there early and i thought wow what a great turnout and, um, you know, because it's not an annual event and it wasn't advertised a whole lot. And I thought, what a great turnout. Well, as we made our ways up the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, I could see people flooding in from every direction wow. coming up the reflection pool. And by the time this got started, there was a massive amount of people. Wow. And, and um, I looked up and saw on top of the Lincoln Memorial, you could see guards and snipers and binoculars up there, and I thought, wow, something, something's going on. Well, it turned out Mike Pence made a surprise visit to come up there and, and kick us off with prayer. But just before he started, uh, this was a spontaneous thing that happened uh, before they actually kicked off the, the, uh, the prayers from the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, I think someone in the crowd started singing a song, and then everybody started joining in and it moved down from the the Lincoln Memorial all the way down the crowd of the uh, reflecting pool. Now, if you've ever been to a baseball game or a football game, somebody will start a cheer and you'll hear it start to to grow through the crowd. And usually it's out of uh, cadence because they they hear it a little bit later than, and so you almost have the same cheer going at two different times. Right. That did not happen here. This was an amazing, amazing thing that happened. It was as if the atmosphere had split open and God rained down his, his spirit and, and blessed this occasion. Everybody throughout that whole place, and you know what the reflection pool is. It yeah. goes for quite a ways. was singing this song in unity. It wow. did not have the, that separation. I, and I've, I've got a little bit of it. I've got the video, and I'm going to post it on your, your Facebook page. Okay. But I've got a little audio from that video. So you can hear what was going on. Okay, let's hear it. Glory. And I, I've read estimates that there were hundreds of thousands of people at this uh, thing. I, I, I don't know. All I know is, is we found a place to sit down because my feet were hurt. And Ann <laughs> likes to see everything. <laughs> I like to see the benches more than she does. Uh, and people were marching by. It was an endless stream of wow. people. I mean, oh. it was. Uh, I've been to the, um, the March for Life before, and it was similar to that. I don't think there was near as many, but it was... V- you think about this in the midst of a uh, COVID and people not wanting to travel on planes. Right. This was not yeah. a well advertised thing. The, people were spending their own money to come down and travel and stay in hotels, and I, I, I you, you come away from this just excited because you know 
for certain that this nation isn't as far gone as the yes. media would like you to believe. There yeah. are a lot of solid Christians that think prayer and unity is a very important thing to happen to this nation right now. If this isn't an annual event, it should be. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting, too, thinking back to our story about Balaam and the king of Moab, I mean, what, what struck fear into the heart of the Moabites, the, the agents of darkness, is seeing the massive number of God's people on the plains of Moab. And I'm, I'm certain that a shudder went through the principalities and powers of the air when they saw God's people gathered on the mall in, in prayer for this nation and in praise and worship of God. So yeah, I think you're right, Jeff. That's a sign that God's not done with us yet. Yeah, it was it was real fitting that uh, I mean before the official thing came came uh, got started, that God would open this up the way He did with people praising and worshiping in unity. And, yeah. And Mike Pence is, is surprised us and had some awesome prayers. Franklin Brand, Graham. There were many many people there that they, these. If there was, it wasn't a political thing. Matter of fact, they told you to leave political signs behind. Mm -hmm. Although the national media, go figure, <laughs> they go find the one guy this. that's got one. Yeah, yeah, they tried to paint it as it was a it was a political event because they saw a few people with "Make America Great" hats uh, uh, mm -hmm. hats on, and there was uh, protests against abortion. Uh, there were signs that were. Pro life, mm -hmm. so they they consider that a political issue when it really it isn't. But anyways, it's a life uh, issue. For th it, it was not a political issue at all. This was about prayer. It was very serious, uh, very joyful. A lot of tears, uh, but joyful tears throughout mm -hmm. the crowd. It was awesome. Well, fantastic. Thanks for that report, Jeff. You know, and the Bible says in Second Chron Chronicles seven that if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and repent and turn from the wicked way, then what does God say? I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. And I think we took a big step in that direction on Saturday. And Brian, is it okay if I post that video yeah, of sure. that, that on, on your Facebook page? Absolutely, absolutely. Top. So you can go to uh, our Facebook page, the Focal Point-Brian Fisher Facebook page, and you can listen to that audio again. All right, great, Jeff. Thank you very, very much for for that report. All right, well, let's uh, turn our attention to a couple of other issues before we get into some of the political content of the day. John MacArthur won another victory in court when a judge awarded them an opportunity for a trial. You, It's amazing, but you've had judges in California that won't even give them a trial. They say, no, we're not going to hear your argument for why the First Amendment, the Constitution of the United States, protects what you're doing. We're just telling you to shut down. We're ordering you to shut down. We're ordering you to lock down. We don't want to hear another word about it. We don't want to hear that you've been gathering in your sanctuary for the, the study of the Scriptures, for worship, for prayer. We want you to cease and desist, and we don't care what the Constitution of the United States says. And this federal judge, a Judge Beckloff, said, well, I got a different opinion. I think the minimum that needs to happen is this church needs to be able to make their case in court. Uh, so that's what's going to happen. So that's good news. You know, and, and meanwhile, John MacArthur's church, they just continued to meet. So they, they said, just, it doesn't matter what the judge says. We're going to meet uh, because Jesus Christ is the Lord of the church, not the Supreme Court, and certainly not the governor of the state of California. Now, here's a sobering piece of news, something we need to work on as a church. According to the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University, this is a cultural center headed up by George Barna, the famous poster, 61% of American millennials, this, these are people between the ages of 18 and 36, 61% of them call themselves Christians. But... Not all of them have a biblical worldview. In fact, do you know how what the number of millennials, the percentage of millennials that have a, a biblical worldview? The answer is 2%. So 
So 61 million of them say we're Christians, but only 2% of them actually have a worldview that's shaped by the Word of God. So here, here's what Barna's looking for, what, how he defines a biblical worldview. You believe in absolute moral truth. You believe that those moral truths are defined by the Bible. You believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life, that God is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe, that salvation is a gift from God. It cannot be earned. That Satan really exists. We've been talking about that today. And that Christians have a responsibility to share their faith in Christ with other people. And the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. So 2% of millennials, 18 to 36, have a biblical worldview. You know, and that's, you know, that's a very clear test. I mean, to me, that's not even a particularly severe test of a biblical worldview. But 98% of millennials cannot pass that test. So church, you know, pastors, you know, these topics that we talked about here in this survey, those are things we need to start hitting with our congregations. We need to start hitting these things in our, in our youth groups, in our middle school groups, in our high school groups, in our college age groups. We need to make sure that those topics, those biblical things are addressed over the course of our teaching. All right. Let's talk about the Supreme Court just for a second. Amy Coney Barrett, of course, a lot of people trying to blister her. You know, and it's interesting to me, I've been watching the left flail around trying to get some kind of traction, trying to figure out how they can attack her. And they have not found a way to be able to do it. You know, she's very winsome. She's very, obviously, her demeanor is very pleasant. She's not threatening. She doesn't have a hard face, a very soft face. She has a mother of seven kids. She adopted two kids from Haiti, one of the most impoverished places on the face of the globe. And so she and her husband adopted these two kids from Haiti and have given them a shot at liberty, a shot at the American dream, a shot at a lifestyle full of a life full of promise and opportunity. And that's the only way they can get at her. They're trying to raise some kind of suspicion about the adoption agencies that arranged for the adoption of these children into their family, which shows you just how hard up they are for anything they can use to attack uh, this uh, woman. Now, let's got a couple other sound bites we want to get in here about the initial response to Amy Coney Barrett. Remember, she was announced on, on Saturday. And, I mean, the left just immediately just went nonlinear. They, they went completely out of orbit. Here is Dick Schumer, clip number two. Now, this is a guy that obviously does not have a biblical worldview about heaven. You won't find anything in the Bible that there are cemeteries in the age to come. But Chuck Schumer apparently thinks there are. Clip number two. Judge Ginsburg had a dying wish that the next president choose. Justice Ginsburg must be turning her over in her grave up in heaven. <laughs> okay. So if they have graves in heaven, Dick Schumer says, she's turning over in that grave in heaven. All right, clip number three. This is Dick Blumenthal who is refusing even to meet with Amy Coney Barrett, which is a custom that the candidate for the Supreme Court, the nominee, meets with leaders from both parties. He's not going to do it. I think Schumer said he's not going to do it. I think maybe Dick Durbin said he's not going to do it. So they're boycotting. Why would they boycott? What do they have? To, it's like they're afraid of this person. They're afraid of this woman. So she's obviously intimidating them right out of their socks. But anyway... Here is Dick Blumenthal talking with Wolf Blitzer, who actually stumbles into some decent journalism here. Clip three. Where does it say that's illegitimate in the U.S. Constitution or in the law? Where does it say that what they're doing, the Republicans, is illegal? Illegal, it may be not under the Constitution, <laughs> under the norms and traditions and unwritten rules of the Senate. It is illegitimate. Uh, but uh, you agree that there's nothing <laughs> illegal or totally illegitimate as to what they're doing. It may not violate the letter of the Constitution. All right. So finally, says it doesn't violate the Constitution. He's in co a complete state of umbrage over this. But uh, illegal, it may be not. So Yoda kind of creeps into the conversation. Illegal, it may be not.
All right, clip number four. This is uh, uh, CNN. Let's listen to this clip. This is another Wolf Blitzer clip. Uh, where she's coming from and what we would anticipate if she does become a justice on the Supreme Court over the next 30 or 40 years. Right, Wolf, absolutely. I just wanted to say that while we were here, um, the crowd behind us, some supporters, started chanting Ariana, I want you to stand by. We can barely hear what you're saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the crowd, she was doing a stand-up for CNN on the Amy Coney Barrett thing, and the crowd around her, totally in support of Amy Coney Barrett, down with CNN, shouting fake news, fake news. It was so loud that they had to shut down the stand-up news report. All right, clip, yeah. Uh, Jeff? It, it, you can almost guarantee if they were shouting a chant about Trump or something, they would have cut away to the crowd, you know, instead. That's right, yeah. Yeah, back to the studio. Now let's go to Al Sharpton, clip number five, The Hate Begins. Let's listen. Not to mention that that was the least diverse audience I've ever seen an announcement like this made <laughs> in my life. I looked around. I was glad her two kids did come out because I couldn't find too many other people of color in that audience. So finally, somebody that's glad that she adopted two poor orphan kids from Haiti. And it happened to be Reverend Al Sharpton. All right, well, we'll uh, take a break and come back with more of these sound bites and get you updated on all the stuff that's going on. I want to give you another insight into Amy Coney Barrett's frame of mind, the philosophy she brings to the Constitution. We'll do that when we come back. Focal Point, American Family Radio. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Right now, our country is in trouble, and people are scared, people are afraid, and we see the violence and the injustices that are taking place. Only God can change this. Uh, this is a problem of the human heart. If you'd like to pray with someone, call us any time of the day or night.
Howdy, and welcome back. What are you laughing at, Jeff? We, we about pep talked all the way through the break and into the next segment. Yeah, you know, the, 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 we you were up. enjoying the break time. <laughs> yeah. So welcome back to Focal Point, the home of the fastest <laughs> 60 minutes in American media. This is the only thing I'm going to say about Black Lives Matter today. I got too, many, too much other stuff. But the offensive coordinator for Illinois State, their football team, his name is Kurt Bethard. He is the son of of four-time Super Bowl champion Bobby Beathard, who for a long time was, uh, I don't know what his title was with the Washington, the team that shall not be named, the Washington Redskins. <laughs> but his son quit his job on Wednesday because he was had been taking heat over his apparent reluctance to b- embrace the Black Lives Matter movement. Remember, which is a Marxist movement. So... It's not about black lives. It's about Marxism and imposing it on the United States. The Black Lives Matter, that's just a cover. That's just a front for what their dark agenda is. And he's not down with that. Uh, Kurt Beathard is not down with that. And here's the last thing he said when he left. He, he put a note on his door, All lives matter to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those were his parting words. To Illinois State, good for him. I right, remember all the trouble in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Well, let me see. I got to finish up uh, on Amy Coney Barrett here. Let's go to clip number six. This is Jeffrey Tubin. He's uh, some considered some kind of legal beagle guru uh, on the uh, left. And what's significant about this? You know, I told you the Democrats have yet to figure out a way to attack Amy Coney Barrett, so they're starting to boycott her. They're just going to stay home. They're going to take their ball and go home. You know, that's what what immature children do when they're not getting their way. So Dick Durbin is going to take his ball and go home. I'm not going to meet with her. Same with Dick Blumenthal. Now, here is Jeffrey Tubin. And remember, Diane Feinstein, Diane Feinstein was the one that climbed all over Amy Coney Barrett in 2017 for her devout Christian faith. And what Dianne Feinstein said to her, you're a danger, you're trouble, because it's clear that your dogma, that is your spiritual convictions, that your dogma lives loudly in you. And we cannot have that, was the implication, in the United States of America and certainly not on the federal bench. So here's Jeffrey Tubin. And the point here, listen, ladies and gentlemen, they are starting to eat their own over this. They have so little idea how to attack Amy Coney Barrett. Clip six. One person who was not thanked during uh, the uh, during this ceremony was was one of the people who was most responsible for Amy Coney Barrett being uh, nominated to the Supreme Court. And that's Senator Dianne Feinstein, who in 2017, when uh, she was the ranking Democrat on the committee, engaged in questioning of, of now Judge Barrett that was so incompetent, so inept, so apparently religiously discriminatory that Amy Coney Barrett became a hero to religious conservatives. So what they're saying, the, the, the poobahs on the left are saying, stay away from the whole religious thing. Stay away from that. Do not attack this woman on the basis of her Catholic faith. We tried that. In 2017, that completely blew up in our faces. The person who was raising the questions came across as a raw, naked, unvarnished, partisan bigot. So stay away from that. Not even talking about the fact that the Constitution says there will be no religious test for any federal office. None, zip, nada, zilch. Can't do it. So that's what they're trying. Now, it doesn't say that Voters can't have their own religious tests. We can apply whatever religious test we want to candidates, and we should. But if somebody's being evaluated for a federal position, the Constitution is clear, no federal, no religious test. And that's what the Democrats uh, tried to do in 2017. Jeffrey Tubin, who's their main legal dude, he's saying stay away from that. Avoid that at all costs. Now, here's Nancy Pelosi kind of addressing the same thing. And what she's doing here in this clip, she's admitting 
that that was a mistake. She won't tell you it is, but she's admitting that that was a horrible mistake to try to attack her on the basis of her religious convictions. Clip 10. That Article 6, which bans religious tests from being a qualification for office, do you think that that should apply to Supreme Court nominees as well? I'm, I'm not going to get into um, anybody's interpretation of one thing or another. The confirmation is the work of the, the Senate, and uh, I trust the judgment of our Democrats there to honor the Constitution. So she said, I'm just not going to get into that whole religious test thing. I'm going to avoid that like the bubonic plague. I mean, like Nancy Pelosi, given the demeanor of Amy Coney Barrett, it's impossible not to like this woman. It's impossible to find a way to demonize this woman. And the Democrats are starting to realize that. That's why they don't know whether to spit or wind their watches. They're just completely nonplussed. You know, so Nancy Pelosi knows that this whole idea of her religious faith is like an IED. Diane Feinstein stepped on it in 2017, blew shrapnel all over the Democrat Party. They're not going to do it again. Now, here's Bill Barr, the Attorney General of the United States, clip number 11, on the whole idea of the separation of church and state. Let's listen. Militant secularists have long seized on that slogan as a facile justification for attempting to drive religion from the public square and to exclude religious people from bringing a religious perspective to bear on conversations about the common good. Yet, as events like this one remind us, separation of church and state does not mean, and never did mean, separation of religion and civics. As late as 1952, Justice William O. Douglas would write for a majority of the Supreme Court that we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. Alexis de Tocqueville, the keenest observer of the early American Republic, praised America's separation of church and state while extolling America's union of the spirit of religion and the spirit of liberty as the key to its success. And Tocqueville identified religion as perhaps the greatest bulwark against the descent into tyranny. Descent into tyranny. So Barr say, look, if you get rid of religious liberty in America, you begin the climb down into the abyss of tyranny. It is the bulwark. Christianity, Christian faith, is the greatest bulwark against a descent into tyranny. So good words then, good words today. Now I want to talk just for a second about this election because this, this is stuff you may not know. I learned some stuff researching for this program today that I did not know before about, you know, we, we've obviously got a tremendously cobbed up process. Oh, oh uh, let me mention one more thing. I got it right at the top of my stack. Amy Coney Barrett's philosophy when it comes to interpreting the Constitution. You are going to love this because you hear this every day on Focal Point. Here's the way... Uh, Elizabeth, Amy Coney Barrett explained it last year. Originalist, that's what she is, originalist, believing that the original meaning of the Constitution ought to be preserved, it ought to be recognized, that's what ought to be used in all of our deliberations. Originalists, like textualists, care about what, listen to this, what people understood words to mean at the time that the law was enacted. So in other words, when we look at the word Religion, what did the founders mean by that? Well, what they meant is they meant Christianity. When you look at the phrase establishment of religion, what did they mean? They didn't mean just saying nice things about God. They meant picking one Christian denomination and making, the official, making it the official established church of the United States and forcing people to go to it, forcing people to support it with their tithes. That's what establishment of religion is. It wasn't saying nice things about God. And Amy Coney Barrett says, we need to get back to what the founders meant when they wrote these words. Each textual provision, she says, must necessarily bear the meaning attributed to it at the time of its own adoption. So it means whatever the founders intended it to mean. It doesn't mean what we can twist and mangle it and misconstrue it to mean. 
It means what the founders intended it to mean. If we don't like the plain meaning that the founders intended, then our alternative is to amend the Constitution if we don't like it. The law, she says, can mean no more or less than that communicated by the language in which it was written. A textualist, she says, hews closely to the rules embedded in the enacted text rather than adjusting that text to make it more consistent with its apparent purposes. This is a blatant rebuke of Neil Gorsuch because that's what he did. He ignored the original meaning of the framers of the 1964 Civil Rights Law. When they used the word sex, they meant male or female, period. And he completely rewrote that, inserted his own definition of the word sex to include transgenderism. Here's what she says, two core principles. First, the meaning of the constitutional text is fixed at the time of its ratification. Second, the historical meaning of the text has a legal significance and is authoritative. The historical meaning of the text is a hard constraint. I love that expression. It is a hard constraint. We are bound by that. We cannot go outside the bounds of the historical meaning of the text. Choke on that, Neil Gorsuch. Now, about the uh, presidential election, what happens if there's no clear winner when the Electoral College meets in December 14? What happens then? Everybody's talking about this thing being tied up in court to the end of time. But ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution tells us how to resolve an election dispute that isn't settled by December 14 when the Electoral College ballots are cast. Here's uh, what you do. If This is the 12th Amendment. You can look it up. If no person has a majority in the Electoral College because they're dithering around and they're arguing and they're debating and they can't come to an agreement about how to count the votes, if no person has a majority of the Electoral College, the House of Representatives shall choose immediately. I'm reading the exact words of the 12th Amendment. The House of Representatives shall choose immediately by ballot the president. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, if there is still confusion on December 14 about the results of the Electoral College, it immediately, you do not pass go, you do not collect $200, you immediately go to the House of Representatives and they immediately cast a ballot to pick the president. So what this means now, Nancy Pelosi is out there saying, look, look, gang, we got to win a whole bunch of these elections in November. But because we need to do what we can to shortstop what happens in the Electoral College. Well, what the Constitution says is the Congress that is in existence now is still going to be in existence on December 14. It doesn't change. It doesn't roll over till the first week in January. So the House of Representatives that's going to take up this issue is going to be the same House of Representatives that we have today. And here's how it works. Every state in this vote, House of Representatives, is going to choose by ballot the next president. And get this. They listen carefully now. Because the way the Constitution puts it, every state, listen to me now, every state has one vote. You know, you think that the House of Representatives gets to vote, so there's going to be 435 people voting on the next president. Not so. Every state gets one vote. So that means what is critical is which party controls the delega delegations in the House of Representatives on those 50 states, because only 50 votes are going to be cast, and it's based on the delegations from each state in the House of Representatives. Get this. Don't miss this. This is the Fisher factoid of the day. Republicans control 26 delegations in the House of Representatives. The Democrats control 22. So in other words, if everybody stays true to their principles, when the House of Representatives goes to vote, even though there are more Democrats in the House of Representatives than there are Republicans, 
the way the Constitution defines the process, it's by state delegations. And Republicans control 26 and Democrats control 22. So that means the next president of the United States on a vote of 26 to 22 will be Donald J. Trump. Now that's the Fisher factoid of the day. So don't forget that. You know, and it's consistent with the Electoral College. The whole principle there is that it's not voters, it's not individual voters that choose the president. It is the states that choose the president of the United States. And this is an example of that, how a republic works, where we pick the people that make major decisions for us. We pick the members of the House of Representatives. If there's no clear winner from the Electoral College, then the people that we chose and put in the House of Representatives, they will choose a president for us. It's a beautiful thing. Bow low before God, stand tall before man, stand in the gap, and never forget we are fighting with God's help. A winnable war. See you tomorrow. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association.